Inside out. How are we feeling right now? Are we doing okay? Man, y'all give it up one more time. That was an awesome set. Give it up. Thank you, guys. That was... We don't get to just, like, chill out for a second, but to hear the voices of everyone in the room is pretty, pretty cool. And I think uh, that God wants to continue speaking to you. I don't know if he's already speak, uh, spoken, spot to you to tonight about something. I don't know if he's already spoken to you tonight about something, but... I think that he's got a word for you if you will listen. And it's true that when we kind of cut out some of the other noises and voices and distractions, like God speaks to us. And he doesn't speak to me like, like a voice audible from the sky. If he does for you, that's awesome. He doesn't do that for me. But oftentimes in moments like this, it's through a thought or a feeling or a realization. And I just hope that tonight is something like that for you. Uh, unrelated to that, I've been traveling a lot recently, been all over the place, and I've been on a lot of planes. Anyone like to fly? Anyone just like, I love going and getting on a plane? Yes, okay. Anyone flown anywhere recently? Anywhere cool? Shout it out. What? Vegas. You should have come and played Slapjack. You would have known the rules. That would have been awesome. Um, I've been flying a lot recently. I flew, actually I counted, uh, my little app, my uh, Delta app tells me I flew 30 times so far this year. I've been somewhere 30 different times on these planes. And it's so funny to me when I get on a plane because there's this little battle that happens every single time. And I'm always, I like being the last person on the plane. That is my goal every time. I want the door to hit me on the way through. I do not like sitting around. And so I get to the airport like 40 minutes before my flight. I fly through everything and I want to get on the plane very last. But every time when I get on the plane and I'm getting closer to my seat, I'm always surveying for who I'm going to be sitting next to, right? Because I'm trying to figure out, we're about to sit next to each other for a long time, and I want to know who they are. And I, public transit is weird, first off. Like, in what other context do you sit next to a stranger and not say a word for an hour or two or three? Very, I don't do that with my friends. I don't want my friends to sit next to me that close for that long. And I sure as heck don't want a stranger to do it, but that's what we're doing on the plane. And the crazy part about it is we're always in a fight over... This little two-inch wide armrest right here, right? I'm all, every time, you're like, is this about God tonight? It is. It'll get there. Don't worry. But every time I'm getting on a plane or maybe you get on a bus or something like that, like there's this unspoken fight over the armrest. And we never say a word to each other. Usually my headphones are in. The other guy's headphones are in. And there's different types of people, right? There's one person who's just like trying to like keep as small a body footprint as they can in their seat so they do not touch you at all. There's, um, I always, I'm, I'm going for like half of it because I'm trying to seem a little considerate. So I take that back half of the armrest, which is prime real estate for me. I don't know about you. And I'll, I'll give them the front half to seem nice. But every once in a while I get there and somebody is sprawled out. You ever seen that? And they're like, they're over, they're, they're not even just on the armrest, they're over in my seat. They got their leg up over the thing. They're shaving their legs onto my seat. Or I don't know, they're like way up in my bubble. And, and in those times, I'm just thankful that no one's actually ever shaved their legs on a plane, at least that I've seen, okay? But in those times, I'm thankful for this little two-inch armrest because it is the thing that separates, hey, this is my spot and that is your spot. This is my space and that is your space. And things are going to go best here if we just stay in our space. And really, there's this little gray area right here that we're fighting over. But outside of that, like, I know where I stand. I know where you stand. This thing's going to go great if we just respect that and you don't prop the leg over. And we, we have these boundaries. Boundaries are a natural part of our life. They separate things. They help us in so many different ways, right? And we just take them for granted. Uh, maybe driving. Anyone get their driver's license recently? and start driving in Atlanta, anybody, anybody, no? Anyone have their driver's license? Just, uh, just okay, yeah, we got a few, you're driving around, you've seen it. Have you ever like thought about, in a scene like this, the only thing keeping people from hitting each other is some paint on the ground. That's the only thing. There's no barrier between these lanes. There's just paint on the ground which is a natural boundary, because if you start getting into my lane, if you cross that paint, you're now in my space, and we're going to have some issues pretty quick, right? I'm laying on that horn every single time. And if I cross into your lane, I hope you land, land the horn too. Boundaries in all sorts of areas of life. How about state lines? We don't think about this too often, okay? This is the southeast United States. Uh, you guys uh, live about there, is about the spot in Georgia. But like, 
the boundaries of each of these kind of contain a different type of identity, right? Like I'm from down here. This is where I live. Uh, that's where I grew up, right there in Florida. Any Floridians? Anyone grow up? Any, no? You got one or two, okay? Y'all, y'all are all weird. We all are. It just is a thing. And there's, when you cross, when I drive up from home or I drive back home, there's a, there's a very clear sign that says, Welcome to Florida, the sun, Sunshine State. And I know that I've crossed the boundary into this new part of the country. And y'all, Florida's weird. So you should be thankful there's a border between you and it. Because you don't have to be associated with all the news stories that come out about the next Florida man. I do. This is actually, I'm no, no joke, people are so weird in Florida. This is an example. This is the real, I didn't know if I was going to show you this, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling like I should. This is actually my friend Lane. Um, in the middle of a hurricane, that is a real hurricane, it was in Florida, and Lane went outside, it was actually a video, I should have brought the whole video, it became a meme, and he went outside and he is head banging to some screamo song with the American flag out there. That's what us Floridians are like, okay? We may dress up, but you can only dress a pig so much, that's what we look like. All right, let's go back to that state thing, get off Lane for a second, okay? I don't need Lane shirtless up here while I'm speaking. And at the same time, like, I'm thankful there's a border between Florida and Georgia because there's a different identity that we get to have where if that was not there, we would lose some form of that identity. And up here in Georgia, people are crazy. I don't know if you knew that. They walk around on Saturdays, like, barking at each other over football games, which is the crazy, it freaks me out. Grown men, your dads, they walk around and they bark at each other. Over 18-year-olds playing football. That is a real thing that happens in this state. (laughs) Freaks me out. I don't like it. I'll take the hurricane American flag thing over your dad's barking at 18-year-old. I'm thankful there's a border between Florida and Georgia. You're probably thankful there's a border between Georgia and Alabama. (laughs) And Alabama's probably thankful there's a border between them and you, (laughs) right? Because these borders, they don't keep us out. We kind of freely move between these. I can drive to whichever one I want, but what they actually do is they define what is inside of them. They give definition to what is inside of them. And that is very, very, very important. And, And this idea of borders, of boundaries, should make sense in our mind in the physical sense, armrests, lanes on the road. State lines, those make sense. Those are boundaries that make sense that help us all, that define what is inside of them so we can better live together and be one united country or or all make it down I-75 safe. But the much harder version of boundaries to walk or to understand is relational boundaries, right? the, The principles are almost exactly the same, but it's so much harder because you can't see it with your own eyes, but all of us are in relationships, not dating relationships. Some of you are like, I wish, but all of us have friendships. You have family relationships. You're around people at school, you're around people on your team, whatever. And, and sometimes we don't really know where one person starts and the other begins. And that's what we got to know. We're going to do a little, little Mad Lib. Anyone a fan of a Mad Lib? Okay, that's great. It's going to be an interactive portion of the show tonight. So I'm going to need some really, I want your best creative answers to what I'm about to ask you, okay? Okay? Okay, I'm just making sure we're alive here inside out. All right. As you can tell, I was an art major. I'm just kidding. Business business major. Uh, We're going to say this guy is you, wherever you are. I will give you eyes. And you're smiling. And this is just somebody else, okay? I haven't figured out who, but they're a friend of yours. They are also smiling. That is just a friend of yours. They look, it kind of looks like a long nose of a duck on this one for some reason. It looks like a smiley face there. Forget about it. It's okay. And we're just going to, let's make up a few characteristics. So um, let's say that you have, how many siblings? Someone yell out a certain number. Two siblings. How many does your friend have? All right, someone said 45. <laughs> Woo! That is... Those parents like each other. That's all I'm saying. All right. 
Whoa, hey, hey, hey. That's natural. Uh, give me some hobbies. What are some hobbies? You like what? Tennis. You like tennis. Someone yell out one for your friend. That's too much to write. What? Volleyball. Your friend likes volleyball. Give me another non-sport uh, thing. Chess. Someone said chess. I'm going to say you both like chess. Um, let's see. What's your GPA? Someone tell me your GPA. 1.2. All right. Someone give me your friend's GPA. What is your friend's GPA? 4.8. What do y'all talk about? I don't know. Chess. You talk about chess. That's exactly right. Um, let's say, is your friend in a relationship? Is your friend dating somebody? I'm going yes. Dating. Are you dating somebody? Y'all single. Not only that, prom's coming up and you need a date. I know. Wait, what is there something else coming up you need a date to? Homecoming. Homecoming's coming up and you need a date. Poco, date. Okay. It's exciting. Any other characteristics we got for these people? Okay. Looks great. Let's say that, um, let's add, okay, this is not as funny, but let's add some reality to the, to the mix here, right? Let's, um, let's say that maybe you have some family, like, illness. Maybe there's an illness in family. Just trying to make real people, okay? I know 47 siblings is not real. You get a, you get a show if you, on TLC if you have that many. Illness in the fam. Let's say that your friend... Maybe there's a divorce going on in the fam. Okay, that's just a, it's just reality. I'm, just adding, I'm adding some reality to the mix here. Um, let's say you guys go to Inside Out together. Anyone here with a friend at Inside Out tonight? But I'm going to add here that you guys both have kind of your own separate spiritual lives going on, right? So you have your spiritual life. They have their spiritual life. I'll add a few more. Let's say your friend has some big drama going on right now with who? Someone name a name. Nicole. Nicole sounds dramatic. I'm just saying it. Okay, I'm sorry about the Nicoles in here. Nicole, we got some drama with Nicole going on. Let's say you. This is good. I'm happy with this. Okay. I said that your friend has drama with somebody. They said Nicole. I said I put Nicole up here. Does that make? Got it. No, no, no. That's just someone else. It's just Nicole. You know Nicole. Everyone knows Nicole. Okay. <laughs> She got drama. You're new around here. We'll introduce you. Nicole, she's around here. She got drama. So this is what's going on, okay? You, you, I'm just trying to give a, a, a somewhat of a picture of what different people can look like. And you guys are friends. You bond a lot over chess. <laughs> you bond a lot out of, over inside out. Those are really the only two things you two got going on. Everything else is total opposite. And here's the thing. Sometimes, if we're not careful in our friendships and our relationships with other people, we can blur the lines here on where you stop and they start. Or on what is your responsibility and what is their responsibility. Maybe, maybe they see that you need a homecoming date and they take the liberty of asking someone out for you without telling you. Okay, that's crossing a boundary, yes? She said, ah, take what I can get. <laughs> for me, that's crossing a boundary. Don't ask someone out for me unless I ask you to, and even that, like, let me do it. Or let's say that you have this 1.2 GPA, things are not going well in school, and your four-pointed friend doesn't ask you 
hey, do you want help with your school? They just show up at your house with all their books and like, all right, we're going to study for the next three weeks straight. You ready? You're like, whoa, whoa, I didn't ask you to come fix that. Or let's say on the other side, they're dating someone. Or let's say, let's go down here with our drama with Nicole. And you get so invested in this drama with Nicole, you would never do that, I know, inside out. But you get so invested and you just kind of stoke it and you love to talk about it because it's kind of fun to talk about people that we don't like or that are doing things that we don't agree with, whatever. So you just get so invested and you get caught up and it's getting to the point where that's affecting you because of how much you're involved in their drama. Was that yours? What are you responsible for? Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Paul's this guy, is, is an incredible story. I wish we had more time to talk about Paul. But he started the New Testament, and then he goes and starts much of the church outside of Israel. So he is starting these little communities. And I'm talking about little communities in big cities before Christianity was, like, well-known, or people knew too much about it, or popular. Nowadays, it's a little different, right? It's very much a part of the culture, whether people are following it or not. People at least have some sort of preconceived notion. But Paul is starting these little communities of Jesus followers around the world. And, and he's trying to help them navigate their relationships. And he is actually pretty frustrated when he writes this letter to a church in Galatia. Everyone say Galatia. It's kind of fun. And he writes this letter to the church in Galatia who's having some real relational issues. Some real boundary issues. They're getting so caught up in each other's lives. They're comparing each other to one another. They're jealous over what each other has that they don't. That's what's going on in Galatia. It's very clear because Paul says, you guys are doing this, cut it out. And he just got done talking about the Spirit of God and how living with the Spirit should transform our relationships. And then he gives them some real practical advice on how to do that. And he's going to walk through a few situations here. Okay, we're going to go on a ride. It's going to take a second, but I'll explain what is going on. You ready? Paul says this, Galatians 6. Brothers and sisters, if a person is caught doing something wrong, you who are spiritual should restore someone like this with a spirit of, with a spirit of, thank you. And watch out for yourselves. So you won't be tempted to. So Paul starts by saying, all right, let's talk about other people. And let's just use the example, Paul says, of if they were caught doing something wrong. Like the community just catches them. They're doing something that is totally wrong, that is sinful, that is against God, that's hurting themselves, hurting others. And this word brothers and sisters, he's talking to other Jesus followers. Okay, so it's, it doesn't completely translate to people outside of the Christian community. But he's talking about inside the Christian community. Inside the church, if you're following Jesus, someone else is following Jesus, this applies right here in your group. If a person is caught doing something wrong, you who are spiritual should restore someone like this with a spirit of gentleness. He didn't say, hey, if someone's caught doing something wrong, someone's got an issue, you should go and show them what's up. He didn't say you should go yell at them. You should go to them and say, God's so mad at you, right? He's not saying any of those things. He's saying, stay in your lane. Stay on your side of the board here. But help restore them. Reach out. Don't invade their lives, right? And then he says, while you're doing that, watch out for yourselves so you won't be tempted to. So be like if we wrote something for your friend here that you clearly knew they shouldn't be doing that they were doing anyway. And you were worried for them. And instead of reaching out and saying, hey, can I help you with that? Or, hey, do you see this issue? Or, hey, I think this is actually hurting the people around you. You jump in and say, I'm coming to fix it. Or you jump in and say, God's mad at you. He's not going to forgive you. You should be so ashamed. Like it's two totally different approaches. Do you see that? But what Paul's saying here is when someone else has something going on, you stay inside your boundary knowing full well that one day this will probably be you because you ain't perfect either, and you reach out with a spirit of gentleness, and you try and correct them, you try and help them, and you watch out so that you don't get sucked in and become somebody who you aren't. 
And I think if we boiled it down, what we would say is that you want to know who you're responsible to here? You're responsible to each other. Keyword, to. Everyone say to. You're responsible to each other. Are you responsible for each other? No. Responsible to. To love, to reach out, to care for, to help. To carry each other's burdens. To help when things are hard. To say, hey, I know that divorce is going on. If you want to talk about it, I'm here to talk about it. I'm responsible to help you with that. Am I responsible to tell you what you should feel or tell you how to deal with your parents in the middle of it? No, I'm just responsible to help you with it. Am I responsible for this drama? Am I responsible for what's going on in your dating relationship? No, it's none of my business. But I'm responsible to keeping you accountable, helping you follow Jesus, and being a listening ear, being someone who is going to help and share with you along the way. You're responsible to each other. And now he flips it and he says, all right, now let's talk about you. And it's a little more uncomfortable. He says this, each person should test their own work and be happy with doing a good job and not compare themselves with others. Each person will have to carry their own load. It says each person should test their own work, meaning each person should look at their own life and be happy with doing a good job without comparing themselves. That is very hard. And carry their own load. What this means is you should be able to look on this board and say, okay, here are the things that are me and mine and my things to be responsible for. And I don't need to compare with somebody else. Hey, I like tennis. I'm good at tennis. But I actually think I would like volleyball better, but they're so much better than me, and I'll never be as good at tennis as they are at volleyball. Or they beat me in chess every single time. Or how come they're so smart and I'm so dumb? Paul's saying, no, that's not a way to live at all, comparing yourself to somebody else. And he's saying, hey, your spiritual life, your singleness and needing a homecoming date, your hobbies, the things going on in your family, you are responsible for those. You don't have to expect your friends to come and solve them for you. You don't have to expect them to come. You don't have to impose those on other people. Can they share with you? Yeah, you should open up and share with them. But you should share with them knowing that you are responsible to others and responsible what? For yourself. Say this whole sentence with me. You're responsible to each other and for yourself. Tell your neighbor you're responsible to each other. Tell your other neighbor you're responsible for yourself. Tell someone behind you, I'm responsible to you, but I'm responsible for myself. That's right. This is what Paul's saying. You're responsible to love each other. You're responsible to care for each other. But you got to know where your boundary stops and theirs starts. Now we've been talking in this one of a kind series about who you are. Right? We've been talking about identity, we've been talking about how you fit into the crowd, you're talking about how unique you are. And I would say if we're talking identity, not just talking boundaries, this is who you are. That is the core of your identity, okay? That's the core of your friend's identity. So it matters most. You're God's child. You're God's beloved. He loved you so much that he died for you, raised back to life so you could join him in this new kind of life forever. That's your identity. It's who you are. You can't run far enough. You can't hide enough. There's nothing that you could love. No hobby could mean enough. No relationship could mean enough as that. So that's who you are. And then you come in here and you say, all right, what am I responsible for? For as me, I, I am God's child, but I'm responsible for these things. I'm responsible for chess. I'm responsible for being single, needing a date, trying to find one, even though it would be really great if someone helped me. Or that girl over there, she said she was looking uh, because she wanted someone to set her up, so you're welcome to do that. And then, well, your friend over here is responsible for, hey, I am God's child. I like chess. I'm going to cross over here for sure. There's some crossover in who we are and what we do and what we care about. And we'll double circle that and double circle that. 
And just like state lines, it's like the armrest on a plane. Things will happen better in your life. Your relationships will be healthier. You'll be able to share more freely. You'll feel invaded less often and you'll invade other people's lives less, of, less often. You'll have more wisdom in navigating tensions. You'll have more joy with your friends. You'll have more fulfillment in your relationships. When you know that ultimately you are God's child, you're responsible for all the things that make up your life. And other people are responsible for all the things that make up their lives. And when we get to walk in the confidence of that, walk in the fullness of that, we can be people that don't put expectations on others that they were never meant to carry in the first place. And we can be people that aren't carrying expectations that never should have been put on our shoulders in the first place. When we know where our boundary stops and theirs starts. And Paul thought this was important enough to include in his book to the church that is just starting out because he wanted the church to be a representation of the love of Jesus to everybody in their community. He wanted the church, he wanted the people of the church to love each other, to respect each other in the same way that God loves and respects us so that the people around them could see this budding church, this group of people meeting and say, wow, something is so different about them. Their relationships are so loving. Their relationships are so kind. They know who they are and it's kind of crazy. And they're just walking with this confidence in God and confidence with each other because they know whose they are, they know who they are, and they know where their boundaries are. And that is just an awesome way to be a light to the world, to be a light to the school that you're at with your friends, to be a light on the team you're on, to be a light in this room, to be a light with your group, to be a light in your household, is to live in the kind of community and with the kind of love for others that says, hey, I know where I am, I know where you are, let's just walk together. Can I pray for us? Jesus, you are so good and you're so kind and you give us each other. Like we, you give us each other as a gift. You give us relationships as a, as a gift. And we love that. And I pray that you would just increase our capacity to love each other. Pray that you would show us who we are. Pray that you would keep us out of the comparison trap. I pray that you would keep us out of other people's drama, but you would keep us in the full awareness of your love for us and our identity in you. I pray that you would help us to share freely with others without putting crazy expectations on them. Guide us in the tension and in the gray of relationships. We love you so much, Jesus. It's in your name. Amen.